these magi are from Babylon. They are a member of a class or a group of individuals that have gone on from a number of generations. They're, they have been influenced greatly by maybe the greatest magi of all. His name was Daniel. And Daniel is known to have actually saved them, so he was a hero for the magi. At one time, their king in Babylon had ruled that all of them should be destroyed and killed. But Daniel had stepped forward and given interpretation to the king's dream, actually been able to tell the, dream, the king what he had dreamed and then told him the interpretation of his dream. And as a result, God had rescued the Magi. And you might understand that the book of Daniel at points is kind of confusing to understand. Maybe they did as well. But Daniel wrote that book as the chief of all the Magi. And they would have received the instruction from that book. And they would have learned from Daniel as well to search the Hebrew scriptures and to discover the deeper meanings that were revealed in that book. And in that book, Daniel spoke of the coming one, of the prince that was coming, and they had learned themselves to look for the coming one, the prince that was coming. They had learned to anticipate that there was coming this one great world ruler that would bring salvation to all the earth, and they began to study the Hebrew scriptures and the teachings of Daniel and passed it on from one generation to the next and they blended in that with it, uh, a study of the stars as well. There's somewhat of a question as to how a study of the stars would any way at all have been used by them to have found the Christ child. And if you read your Bibles, you'll find at times in the Old Testament, particularly that God forbids astrology and God at other times actually is mocking the cultish non-science of, of uh, astrology as well. But there was kind of a Jewish brand to uh, astrology as well because their calendars, the calendars that the Jews had made and went by was basically charting out the chart or the movement of the stars. Their astrology in this sense was simply an understanding that God was, the creator God was sovereign over everything and God demonstrated his sovereignty over the universe and over the world by the way in which he carried out his will in time. And the way that he carried out his will in time was revealed even in the expression of the stars. And so, in some way, which we don't understand, they charted the progress of God's revelation and God's work and God's sovereign handiwork and power through the course of the various stars. And it, it seems that God used this idea and this thought and this point of interest in the lives of these wise men to demonstrate to them a sign that God had sovereignly brought in the fullness of time the coming one, the prince, and that he had been born in Jerusalem. And this should, by the way, remind us that we cannot exclude God's voice from speaking to whomever he wills. That God has a way of penetrating and speaking and condescending to the sensitivities and the manner in which people receive information and instruction to teach them and communicate to them and and I'm sure by now you've heard of a great work of God that's taking place in the Middle East, where there are people in the Muslim religion that are converting and turning to Christ in large numbers, largely because of dreams that they're having, in which the Lord Jesus is making himself known to them. And it's just another demonstration of how God condescends to speak to people in a manner, in a way in which they have learned to receive or uh, uh, gain information of great or supernatural things. When the Lord Jesus came, the nation of Israel was looking for a prophet and a Messiah that could do the great miracles that had been done before by great prophets, and the Lord Jesus didn't disdain that interest and that desire, but he, he conducted all the miracles, all the miracles that had been formed. If you go through the Old Testament and you enumerate all the different miracles that were performed by men of God and the, and the great prophets, you'll see that the Lord Jesus does all of them and more during his earthly ministry in order to, in a sense, direct their attention and to gain their interest and to proclaim to them and reveal God's character and God's nature and God's message and God's gospel to them. And God is still doing that today. He's speaking to people all over the earth and communicating to them and revealing to them himself. What's interesting here in this passage is that these Babylonian wise men are searching the skies for the sign and God uses it to lead them to the birthplace of the Messiah. And, but we should note that whatever teaching they had was far less than what was available to any priest or any scribe in the land of Judea at that time. But not any priest or any scribe in Jerusalem or Israel went to seek the Lord Jesus and worship him. These magi did. 
They came and they went. In fact, it's just another point of observation that our Lord Jesus spoke on many different occasions with wonder at those who outside of Israel, who were not the initial ones to whom he had come to reveal himself and his salvation, were oftentimes the ones who most eagerly and willfully and yearningly responded to his appearing. The Lord Jesus will marvel over the faith of the centurion who believes that the Lord Jesus has the authority just to speak the word and it will bring a healing touch to his sick servant. And the Lord Jesus spoke of, uh, of uh, the time of Jonah and the city of Nineveh and how the city of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah and yet the nation of Israel won't repent at the proclamation of their Messiah in their midst. And he marvels at these things. Just a few weeks ago, we were preaching about the 10 lepers that the Lord Jesus healed, and we noted that nine of them went their way as soon as they got gratification for what they desired, but one was brought to a point of gratitude, and he returned to bow and thanksgiving and worship at the feet of the Lord Jesus, and the one who returned was the only non-Jew among them. It was a Samaritan. And Again, the Lord Jesus marveled at these things and at their response. And to this, now we can add the testimony of these magi, these wise men who come from Babylon and who witness against the leaders of Israel. They had far less revelation than these priests and these scribes in Jerusalem, but they did far more with what they had received. We live in a very privileged privileged nation. We have been the heirs of an ongoing current of the witness of the gospel through the generations. We have for over 200 years had the freedom to seek God out and worship him and know him and gather to learn of him. And there is a tradition that informs us. Our our nation to a large extent is, is still moving off of the fumes, you might say, of the great works of God that God has done in our nation on multiple occasions. God has revealed himself to us. God has given us places where we may freely worship unmolested and undisturbed and unpersecuted. From this place, there's been a a plethora of rich material that's been written and commentary that's been written on the word of God. You can go to your websites today. You can go to different publishing sites and find all kinds of books that are available to you on end. And maybe you've purchased some for family members over the Christmas season. We have we have untold wealth in the revelation of who Jesus Christ is and the witness of Jesus Christ to our community and our land. And the question is, will we respond to all of this favor with earnest, diligent faith and in light of these things, seek out and be motivated to seek the Lord Jesus and worship him and lay our lives before him? Or will we become, in a sense, ones who take for granted our privileged position? And take for granted the ease and access in which we have to the throne of God. And as a result, neglect and pass over the opportunities we have to go and seek out the Savior and worship Him and bow before Him. There's a concern that rises up and it was, I don't know if it's even a popular question being asked now. I think people have come up with answers that have taken them away from the gospel, but about 20 years ago, particularly, it seemed to be the most prominent answer that was being asked by a generation of young Christians coming out of the churches, and and that was, what about all those people who have never heard the gospel? What about all those people in dark places around the world where the light has never shined? And Well, here are these wise men coming from the darkness of Babylon, and yet there, with what light they were given, they had found and sought and searched out and longed for and talked until they found themselves coming and seeking the Savior. The real question to ask is not what do we think of and what takes place for those who have so little light, but what does God account from you who has so much? And what God has given you? What are you doing with the light that's been revealed to you? I think the, the lesson here is that we should seek Him in your time. You should seek Him out in the season that God has given Him. You should take advantage of the light that he's provided for you. In every way possible, you should use it in order to come before the Savior and bow before him and worship him and receive his truth. And if you do, then you'll be counted wise. But you can't detract from your obligations to the light by fretting over the lack of light that others might have. We've seen here that God can make himself known. God can make himself known in every place. And he does in wonderful ways. Now, When they came to the place where they found the child, 
we're told that they presented to this child gifts, and there are three specific gifts that are mentioned. And they presented these gifts as one would present it to royalty. It's, you know, the custom of the day that you would give gifts to the king, not the other way around. You'd bring gifts to the royal one that you were coming before to pay homage to, and these gifts were used, as we'll note, to strategically provide for Mary and Joseph. After this occasion, we'll discover that Herod seeks to destroy the baby, and Joseph is informed in a dream that he has to run and flee, and he runs and flees to Egypt, and they've already traveled to, from Nazareth to Bethlehem, and they've settled in Bethlehem, and now they're being forced to leave again, and you would understand it's a young family and they don't have very many means and how are they going to survive and God brings a provision for them just in time. What a wonderful testimony, by the way, of how God works in our lives so often. Just in time, God brings just what Mary and Joseph need to provide for themselves and the baby as they become refugees in Egypt. And so these gifts that they receive from these magi will be used as the provision that God will make for them to lived during their time in flight into Egypt. Many commentators, by the way, only look at the gifts that way and so far, just as a way in which God is simply outfitting and God is sovereignly working all things together to outfit Mary and Joseph and provide for them during their time as refugees in Egypt. But I believe there's a lot more to it than that. And I believe it's right to look at these gifts and see that these gifts are revealing something as... You know, if you're a really good gift giver, you're an individual who studies the person that you're going to give the gift to. You know something about them. You, you understand their desires, and you understand something about their nature, and you think long and hard about it, and then you go out and you buy something that perfectly matches their personality or perfectly fits, uh, their, uh, uh, fits the prospects of the one that you're wanting to give it to. It's, it's why husbands are such good gift givers to their wives at Christmas time, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> I just was seeing if you were listening to me at all. That's why wives are such wonderful gift givers at Christmas time. Uh, they study. They know what's going on. They've sympathetically looked over their children and others. And my wife has been presenting to me all the gifts that I'm giving my children over the season. And I'm impressed at how thoughtful I am. At, I'm really, I have really thought this through and there's a reason for everything they're getting. And... Um, there are people like that. There are moms like that and others who work their way through that. When these men traveled to Judah to find the baby, you know, they expected to find him in a palace. They expected to find all of Jerusalem already gathered around him, paying their own homage to him and worshiping him. And they were surprised when that wasn't the case. They didn't come bringing gifts thinking this baby's going to be on the run. And he's going to need some provisions. His mom and dad are going to need some provisions. They, they didn't bring their gifts in order to fulfill some need. They brought these gifts in order to indicate that they understood who he was. They understood what his mission was to be and what he was going to accomplish. They brought these gifts in order to demonstrate to him that they had meaningfully considered his person and were ready to bow before who he was and God was revealing, by the way, truths of this one who was coming. God was revealing to others truths of this one who was coming. You'll remember that Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, when he began to understand that John the Baptist would be wanting to introduce the coming of the Messiah, calls out and prays and rejoices, and he identifies that the Lord Jesus is going to be a day spring who comes from on high and who visits God's people with his tender mercies in order to bring forgiveness of sins and salvation to all. And uh, you'll also see that Mary, when she's told that the baby Jesus is going to come, she's told that the baby Jesus is going to sit on the throne of his father David and that he's going to reign over the house of Israel for Jacob forever. In other words, the Lord was revealing something of the purpose and the intent and the character of this babe that was to be born. Joseph had revealed to him that Jesus would fulfill the promise of Emmanuel, which means God with us. The shepherds are told that he's to be the Savior, the Messiah, and that he's born unto all of them. Simeon is in the temple, and he has revealed to him that the baby Jesus that he's holding in his hand is the promised Messiah, and that he would be a sign that would be spoken against, and that he would reveal the untrue nature of the hearts of many, and that he would suffer 
And as a result, a sword of suffering would pierce through the heart of his own mother, Mary. Simeon has these things revealed to him. The point here is that there were a number of individuals who knew knew more of the way and the future of the baby Jesus than you might imagine. These magi knew more as well. And their gift reflected, reflected what they had come to understand of who this Jesus was and something of the ministry that he would fulfill. So let's, let's look at these three gifts. It won't take us very long. And the first thing we'll see is they brought gold fit for a king. Gold was the medal of kings. It was considered the most precious of all medals, and it was a symbol of royalty. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 10, don't. But if you go to 1 Kings chapter 10 later, uh, there you'll have a record of all the gold that Solomon amassed for himself and that came into his coffers on an annual basis. And we're told that Solomon was receiving 666 talents of gold a year. He was receiving gold that was being brought to him and being brought into his king. And yet we're told that when the queen of Sheba came and with amazement recognized the the wealth of Solomon and the splendor of his palace and the wisdom that God had given him, that she appointed an additional 120 talents of gold be given to him. Solomon had enough gold. He didn't need 120 more. It wasn't given to meet a need. It was given as an expression of an honor and recognition of his great royal power. The gold was given to the baby Jesus because these magi, these wise men, knew that Jesus was the king. And when they asked, where is he born king of the Jews, they didn't mean, where is he who will one day become a king over this small people of Israel in the small area of Roman Palestine? That's not what they were referring to. When they ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Not that he's going to become king, but he's already king. They were inquiring of one that they could go and worship and pay homage to who would be the worldwide king spoken of by Daniel. Actually, now if you want to take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 7. All through the book of Daniel, there are different passages that reveal to us something of the wonder and the majesty of this promised one. Daniel refers to all the kingdoms that rise up at one time in a vision and then all of a sudden there's a great mountain that comes down out of the sky and falls upon the image of all these kingdoms and crushes them to powder and they're blown away and then that mountain rises up to fill the whole earth and it's his image of the coming Messiah that comes who will crush all the empires that have come before him. This is another patch as it kind of reveals this anticipation of the coming one. In verses 13 and 14, Daniel writes of a vision he had. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. When the wise men came looking for the one who was born king of the Jews, this is who they were looking for. This is the one that they were inquiring to. This is the one they were going to bow before and worship. Let's look at another thing. They, they brought to him frankincense fit for a perfect priest. Frankincense Gold for a king, frankincense for a perfect priest. Frankincense was a rare and expensive incense. In Leviticus 2, you'll see that it's set forward in the temple. It was to be mixed with the oil that was to be used to anoint priests. It was mixed with the offerings that were brought before God, the meal offerings that were brought before God that were to be an expression of thanksgiving and fellowship with God. These were not the sin offerings. These were the offerings in which the people wanted to express their desire to commune with God and fellowship, a a meal offering that was presented before God and burnt before God, and these offerings had mixed within them the frankincense. It's the same oil again that was mixed, that was mixed in the oil that was poured out on on the priest as they were anointed to serve God. This way the meal offerings and the priests themselves are being depicted as individuals and things that are acceptable and pleasing and satisfying to God and something that God receives. And so the Magi's gift point that Jesus Christ will be a high priest 
who will stand before God to offer himself on our behalf as the means or the sacrifice or the way into fellowship before God. He is the one who will make us acceptable and pleasing to God. It's him that we present before God that brings us into fellowship with God. He's both the anointed priest and the anointing offering of worship by which we come before a holy God. We know this. We don't come in our own merits before God. We don't come claiming claiming anything good that we have done. We come before God clinging to the garment of our heart priest who presents himself as the one who is all satisfying to a holy God. And we in him are made satisfying to God as well and enjoy fellowship with him. James Montgomery Boyce in a... uh, a book that he wrote on holiday messages, has a wonderful message on this topic, and it's from him that I borrow largely. And he points out the frankincense was never, as we mentioned, never mixed with the sacrifices that represented sin and that were made as a sin offering. They were only put upon the meal offering. And in this case, what we can understand is that the incense is an expression not of a payment for our sinfulness, but as a, what God receives as an expression of righteousness that he recognizes and accepts and he enjoys. It's an expression of sinlessness. It's an expression of one who is being made perfect or has the perfection of God being cast upon him. When you have a little baby that's born, you hold that little baby in your hands and you think this baby is perfect. This baby is so wonderful, but it grows up. You know, those little feet that you want to nibble on and at some point in time, they're no longer tasty to nibble on, right? You, <laughs> set point in time, you, you leave them alone and you make them wash their feet before they go to bed at night. There was even a time when you washed for them, it was kind of pleasant, but after a while, it's like, go wash your feet. It's actually, go put your shoes outside and then go wash your feet. And, You also find out that your children are not so perfect. They begin to reflect not the glory of those innocent days, but they begin to reveal to you, you as you've become in your own failings and your own sin. But the Lord Jesus, the baby that Mary will hold in her arms, is perfect and will grow in sinless perfection. He will be a fragrant incense before God of complete and total moral righteousness. He'll be the spotless lamb of God. He'll be our ground of pleasing fellowship with God when we come to him as our high priest, anointed with all of God's goodness and covering us with himself. Paul actually tells us as believers that we can put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We clothe ourselves with this anointed one, with the fragrance of all his righteousness to come in the Father's presence and he's our high priest. And so they brought the gift of frankincense. Here's the third gift. It was the gift of myrrh. Myrrh fit for a suffering Savior. Now, this gift was not rare, and it was not expensive. Gold was expensive, and frankincense was expensive, but myrrh was hauled into the ports of Israel from Asia Minor in large quantities, and it wasn't expensive whatsoever, and it was primarily used, it was almost singularly used as a spice for the purpose of embalming bodies. It was constantly being sold for funeral arrangements in the marketplaces in any town and any city in Israel. And when Jesus died, we're told in John chapter 19, verse 39, that Nicodemus went and brought to cover his body a hundred pounds of myrrh to cover his body. It was just to stave off the stench of the rotting corpse. Can you imagine this? This is like going to a baby shower and presenting the baby with a headstone, right? For the kings to come and give myrrh to a little baby? They weren't giving it to meet a need. They were presenting it to reveal that they knew something about the mission and ministry of this baby. This gift particularly tells us that these magi knew more than we understand. They came as wise men with a careful knowledge extracted from the scriptures. A knowledge of the suffering and the dying Messiah that the Jews themselves had seemed to miss in God's own revelation. Maybe they had read Psalm 22, and there they'd read about the suffering and the crucifixion of the Christ, and they'd read on to see at the end of that psalm a great expression of his glory and his reign, and that he, he came into that reign through that time of suffering and through that time of death. Maybe they came to it by their own meditations of Isaiah 53. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 53. Let me read to you just a few verses that possibly 
help them understand what this baby was to accomplish. We have different scriptures that are read for our scripture readings in our fellowship. Uh, I think three or four times a year we choose Isaiah 53. I think it's appropriate to read at least that many times each year. Isaiah 53 verses four and five, maybe they read of the Messiah, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Maybe they went on and read and understood from verses 9 and 10, this mission of the Savior to come and die. And they made his grave with the wicked, verse 9 says. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he, was, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see a seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Like John the Baptist, who pointed to the Lord Jesus along the waters of the Jordan and said, Look or behold, the, the Lamb of God who carries away the sins of the world. These magi come to understand that this Savior must suffer and die to bear our sins. And it was the myrrh that they brought that symbolized the suffering and the death that Christ came to offer up for us. Wonderfully, again, they knew something about him more than we could think. They, they gave gold for a king. They gave frankincense for a sinless and perfect priest. They gave myrrh for a suffering and dying Savior. Boyce actually goes on to make a wonderful observation. He notes that in Isaiah 66, there occurs a prophecy that Isaiah makes of a time when the nations will come at the end of the age and they will bring their worship to the Lord, the Messiah, the King of all the earth, and they'll put all their trust in Him. And the beginning of that chapter begins in verse 1. It says this, Arise, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. And we're told that the, in the light of the glory of this reigning king, the Gentile nations are going to flood in to worship him, just like these Gentile kings, these magi had flooded into Bethlehem to worship the Lord Jesus. In verse 6, we read this, as they come to the brightness of his rising dawn, herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Epa, and from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Now this is a picture of Christ reigning upon the earth as king in the last days and the nations coming and traveling him and bringing their honoring gifts to him as well and they bring gold and they bring incense but what Boyce points out is they don't bring myrrh. They bring gold and incense. Not like these past kings, not like the magi. Gold and incense but there'll be no myrrh to present before him at that time because... Christ, voice reminds us, has suffered once for all. The Lord Jesus died one time for all time on the cross for you and I. He came to earth once to die and is coming again at last one time to reign in glory forever and ever. Uh, Montgomery Boyce, actually James Montgomery Boyce, pushes it a little bit further and he makes a point a little bit more. He asks us to recall when the Lord Jesus suffered and died and was buried and when his body was covered with that uh, uh, that that wrapped up body that was wrapped up by Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and put in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea's family and there as they put it in the tomb a hundred pounds of myrrh would have been laid out over and covering that body completely encasing that body and he, he reminds us of the scene when the word comes that the stone has been rolled away in John 20 and Peter and John rush to the tomb and when they come to the tomb you remember John outruns Peter and Peter enters first and then John follows after and when they enter into the tomb they see that the grave clothes are not taken off they're not unwound they're lying there empty shrunken down under the weight of a hundred pounds of myrrh laying in that place and that sarcophagus, unmolested, undisturbed, 
And we told at that time, John tells us at that time that when he sees this sight, the body missing, the clothes lying out there, not unraveled, unwrapped, the myrrh resting upon it, that's what he would have seen. John simply says of himself, he believed. He believed. What did he believe? Well, he believed that, and he embraced the truth that Jesus Christ had indeed risen from the dead. He knew that Christ had conquered death on his behalf and that the myrrh, the myrrh was done with and forever finished. It was left behind in the empty tomb. He died for us once for all, that we might have forever life with him. Christmas is about that great gift. It's about that great gift. The death of Jesus Christ, God's son, for our sins, so that he might reign over us as king and be for us forever our great high priest and bring us in his righteousness before the throne of God to enjoy his fellowship forever and ever. His resurrection from the grave to glory is our promise of everlasting and eternal life. It's kind of a funny thing that when we study this story that oftentimes the takeaway that individuals make are the gifts that somehow we bring to God that gain merit for us. We present to God our goodness, our good deed, or the what little we can gather together, and God takes it and receives it. And it's so good, he welcomes us because we bring, we bring our little pump pum gifts, you know, and we lay it out before, and we're the little drummer boys that see what we can bring, and just the right thing that he honors, that he receives, and that's not the story at all. <laughs> I actually have kind of a funny story. Uh, when I was a... a pastor in my first church I was an assistant pastor and in those days we had a church it was a church of about 350 people we met in a gymnasium uh, next to the stage that we had set up very much like our stage here uh, we had a stage that was set up was bigger than this the pastors actually sat on the stage and the person who led the worship leaders sat on the stage and we sat there throughout the whole message and then when the sermon was over the senior pastor was speaking he would step out and walk out a door that was on the other side just alongside the stage and then we would follow him and we'd go to a place where we'd greet people as they came through those same doors as they were leaving. Now, in this sanctuary, this gymnasium, there was one single door that was in the back of the church, just a narrow little door, about 350 people that would pack in every Sunday. And on this occasion, it was the Christmas season, and the pastor pa- preached on this passage, and he, the message was the gifts that we bring to God. We bring the gifts. It's, it's some, and there was within it this idea that there was something meriting or something wonderful and what we are able to bring to God. And so at the end of the message, there was a Christmas tree by the stage. He, he told everybody that what he wanted to do before they left, he wanted them to bow before the Christmas tree of all things. I think he hadn't thought this out. I, I'm going to give him credit <laughs> that he was winging it. And sometimes when you, I write my notes here because I'm afraid I'll say something really stupid if I wing it. And he wanted everybody as they left and departed to uh, bow before the tree and to give to God whatever gifts God was asking of them and then they could leave. Well, I was the one following him and I can't walk out in front of him. He stopped in front of the tree and so I'm kind of stuck there. I'm there with every, I, I turn around, I was like, okay, whatever God you want, you can have it. It was a really quick prayer and then I followed him but what I noticed is that nobody came through those doors and then I looked in and everybody was crowding out the back door at the back of the church. It was like there was a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, everybody was packed in and they were waiting to get out that back door because nobody somehow felt that it was appropriate, maybe, to give God a gift at a Christmas tree. This account here is not about what they gave to God. It was not about what we give to God. Everything they gave was an indication of, they, of the fact that they understood what God was going to give to us. What he was going to provide for us. He was giving us a king to rule over our lives and bring order in our life. He was going to give to us a high priest so that we could find access to him and worship him. He was going to cover us in the fragrant aroma of his own righteousness. He was giving us a lamb to come and die in our place for our sins. It's all about, it's all about what he's given for us. So, Christmas, Mm. we give gifts, we enjoy it, we celebrate with our children these things, but we have to remember all these things are just a response of generosity out of us to others, merely because of the great and imaginable generosity that we've received from God. 
a king, a priest, a savior, to fall before and worship. Let's bow our heads. How wonderful, how wonderful, how wonderful you are. How glorious to come before you and bow and see in you everything we need. An image and a picture, a presentation of everything we don't have apart from you. Your richness, the overwhelming bounty of your life underscores we have nothing to give and nothing to offer but you have given all. What do we give? An empty, vacated life that could be filled and overflowing with the richness of yourself. That's what we present to you, Lord. Be glorified. Be glorified to inundate us with all of your goodness as we bow before you and trust in you and believe in you. Oh, God, help us to live out the coming year not seeking to prove ourselves and the worth of ourselves by the tokens and gifts we bring to you. May instead you find us always looking, oh, with an openness to receive only what you can give. And by faith to be receiving our Savior again and again and again with wonder and praise and awe. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.